powerful facts about Jesus. Number one, Jesus explained the truth about Jacob's ladder. The phrase Jacob's ladder has gained popularity and has been used to name a movie, book, a flower, and even a piece of technology. But where did this expression come from to begin with? The term Jacob's ladder is used in Genesis 2. Jacob was on the run from his twin brother Esau. Jacob chose to sleep under the stars while he was on the run and alone, with only a rock for a pillow. Jacob had a great dream at Bethel. In it he saw a ladder or stairway that went from earth to heaven. This pointed to a real, continuous, and close connection between heaven and earth, especially between God in his glory and man in his solitude. In his conversation with Nathaniel, Jesus made reference to this event. Jesus would fully show himself as God's chosen son in the coming reign of Christ. The ladder shows how God and people are related to each other. As Jacob's ladder illustrated the connection between God and men, Jesus Christ is the spiritual connection, mediator, and ladder to bridge the gap created by sin between God and men. According to the word of God, Jesus was our ideal Jacob's ladder, who came to earth from the line of Jacob through God's provisions and redeemed us so that we could live in heaven for all eternity. Number two, Jesus explained who he was before the creation of the world. Jesus told us about a lot of secrets, including what happened before the world was made. It happened in John. The prayer Jesus says in John 17 is one of the most important parts of the whole Bible. John 17 verses 4 to 5. I glorified you on the earth by accomplishing the work which you have given me to do. And now you, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world existed. Before the creation of the earth was God, and God had majesty with his Son. God's Son had power. Before our world was made, there had to be something or someone that has always been there. The Bible makes it clear that this is God. Jesus knew about his past life and what it was like. He knew that in the past, when God the Son and God the Father shared glory, Jesus could not honestly pray this if he were not Yahweh himself, equal with God the Father. Number three, the scariest verse in the Bible. This is a verse that many have dubbed the scariest verse in the Bible. Matthew 7:23. And then I will declare to them publicly, I never knew you. Depart from me. You are banished from my presence. You who act wickedly, disregarding my commands. We have here the conclusion of this long and excellent sermon, the scope of which is to show the vital need of obedience to the commands of Christ. We read the context in Matthew 7:22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Christ only accepts those who serve him beyond a mere profession, and those who only have a bare profession will not be acknowledged by him on the final day. It is a reminder that men can fall from great heights of hope into depths of misery. It may seem unusual to hear that even our all-knowing Lord admits to not knowing something or someone. However, Jesus refers to a type of knowledge that relates to personal relationships rather than intellectual knowledge. Number 4. Jesus is the final judge. Jesus is the judge 
the keys are in his hands. To depart from Christ is the very hell of hell. It is the foundation of all the misery of the damned. To be cut off from all hope of benefit from Christ and his mediation. Once the door is shut, it will never open again. However, some people hold on to the hope that the door may open, but there is nothing in the scriptures to warrant such an expectation. Number five, three things that Jesus shared about Satan. Jesus said a good deal about Satan. First, he called him the enemy and the evil one in Matthew 13, 39. Jesus called Satan the enemy in the parable of the weeds. The Bible names Satan, the devil, as God's specific adversary. In the Bible, an enemy of God is also called an adversary or a foe. Anyone who disobeys the Lord's commands is designated as God's enemy. Throughout the Bible, the devil is referred to as the evil one. Second, Jesus calls him the prince of this world. When Jesus was predicting his death, he made that statement. John 12, 31 Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Satan rules a world that includes men and angels separated from God. His desire to be like God. This led to his sin, and now he heads over all rebels who, like him, have fallen into sin. Third, he shared that Satan desired to have Apostle Peter. At the Last Supper, Jesus warned Simon Peter that a test of faith was coming. Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. Luke 22:31. This passage gives us a glimpse into an unseen world. Sift as wheat is a metaphor that can also mean shake someone apart. In biblical times, wheat or grain was sifted through a sieve or large strainer. As the grain was violently shaken, the dirt and other impurities that clung to it separated from the good, usable grain during the threshing process. Satan's goal in sifting Peter and the other disciples as wheat was to crush them and destroy their faith. In reality, the adversary seeks to destroy every believer's faith. Number 6. The Wisdom of Jesus Much has been said about Jesus, his compassion, grace, and humility, but we also see the greatness of his wisdom in Luke 11.31. The Queen of the South will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them, because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Solomon was the son of David, and one of the great messianic titles of Jesus is Son of David. Jesus was a much greater son of David than Solomon ever was. We see Jesus' wisdom when the authorities seek a way to get rid of him. When asked about taxes, Jesus faced a dilemma. If he advocated for paying them, People might accuse him of challenging God's sovereignty over Israel, leading to unpopularity. If someone were to say that taxes should not be paid, they would make themselves an enemy of Rome. But Jesus perceived their wickedness. Jesus once again demonstrated his complete control and wisdom with his response, rebuking the wickedness and hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Herodians. We are responsible to God in all things, but we must be obedient to government in matters civil and national. Peter said it like this, Fear God, honor the king. 1 Peter 2.17 Everyone has the image of God impressed upon them. This means that we belong to God, not to Caesar or not even to ourselves. 
Jesus taught that one can be a true citizen of the kingdom of God while still obeying a foreign ruler's laws by considering them separate entities. This means that the kingdom of God is not of this world. It is worth noting that Jesus didn't just avoid falling into these traps. He also used these situations as opportunities to teach valuable lessons. For example, when it came to paying taxes, he taught about the God-given authority of civil government and its boundaries. The first part of Jesus' answer reinforced Caesar's authority, even in such an unpopular matter as taxes. The second part drew limits. While the state holds a legitimate authority, the authority of God surpasses it. Therefore, those who have faith in God should worship and obey Him. Number 7. His conception was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. The Old Testament revealed hints of the coming Messiah, but only the book of Isaiah was specific with the details. In Isaiah 7.14, the prophet said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The New Testament's book of Matthew confirmed the fulfillment of the prophecy through the birth of Jesus. Number 8. Which Old Testament books did Jesus quote most often? Several times during his earthly ministry, Jesus responded to questions with, It is written. He quotes Isaiah when he explained his reason for using parables to teach. Also, he quotes Isaiah when he rebuked the Pharisees and scribes for their lip service to God. Number 9. Do we even know half of his story? Hence, the Bible is not a total biography of Jesus. The Bible could not contain all his works. John was a man who saw the events of Jesus' life and wrote them down so that other generations might benefit. John 21, 25. But there are also many other things which Jesus did, which, if they were written in detail, I expect that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. The story is larger than anything he can imagine. Perhaps we will learn more in the coming age. Number 10. Only three people from the Bible, including Jesus, were able to fast for 40 days. Jesus endured hunger in the Judean desert for 40 days while the devil tempted him. This is still one of the most popular Bible stories, which taught people how fasting is an important part of faith. Moses completed the prolonged fasting before Jesus did. Elijah also completed this great feat. Number 11. Isaiah also prophesied Jesus' resurrection. Isaiah 53 prophesied about the resurrection. Isaiah 53 verses 5 to 6. But he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the wrongdoings of us all to fall on him. Number 12. The last miracle of Jesus on earth before his ascension to heaven. The second miraculous fish catch in John 21 was the last miracle of Jesus on earth before his ascension to heaven. Seven of the disciples were together at the time. Simon Peter decided to go fishing on the lake, and the others agreed to go with him. That night they caught nothing. Jesus awaited them as they rowed towards the shore in the morning, although they did not recognize him. It is the same as if the Lord asked, 
Young men, have you anything to eat? Disappointedly, they answered him, no. As far as they knew, he was just a stranger walking along the shore. Yet, in response to his advice, they cast the net on the right side of the boat, and lo and behold, a great load of fish, so many that they could not pull in the net. John was the first to recognize the Lord and promptly told Peter. The latter put on his outer garment and went to the shore. Number 13. Jesus' birth came after 400 years of silence from God. Do you want to know what God did after the Old Testament prophets died? God remained silent for 400 years until Jesus' birth. Several nations overtake Israel during these 400 years. Israel successfully rebels against some, but by the time Jesus arrives, Israel has been occupied by the Romans. The Israelites desired a savior, as they had for 400 years in Egypt. No wonder they begged Jesus to overthrow Rome, just as the Red Sea had done for the Egyptians. Number 14. Jesus was probably not born in December. Although December 25th has been recognized as Christmas Day for almost 1700 years, it is known that Jesus was not born in December, or even during winter. Emperor Constantine officially designated the winter solstice, which falls on December 25th, 336 AD, as the day to celebrate Christmas. It is believed that Jesus was born in the spring, based on the mention in Luke 2 of shepherds watching over their flocks in the fields. Number 15. The wise men were not there on the very day of Jesus' birth. Many of you might have heard that the wise men did not appear during the night of Jesus' birth. No matter what nativity scenes may try to tell you, when they approached Herod, it took a while to complete the walk from their motherland to Judea. This means they did not see Jesus on the day that he was born. Number 16. Why did Jesus allow the demons to enter the herd of pigs? The account of Jesus casting the legion of demons into a herd of pigs is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. According to this story, demons inhabited a particular man. The demons made the man extremely violent. The demons proposed that they leave the body and enter the bodies of swine instead. When the demons entered the herd, they caused the herd to become crazed, and they ran off a cliff into the Sea of Galilee. Because it served his purposes, Jesus had no reason not to accept their proposal. One, it resulted in the liberation of the man from the demons. Two, pigs were considered unclean animals under Jewish law, making them an ideal symbol and haven for unclean spirits. Three, accepting their proposal did not affect the demons' eternal fate on Judgment Day. More importantly, Jesus was not sinning by accepting the demons' offer. Number 17. Facts Jesus shared about heaven that many don't know. Matthew 13 contains several parables of Jesus about the mysteries of the heavenly kingdom. The first four parables, the sower, the wheat and the tares, the mustard seed and the leaven are outward manifestations of God's movements. The last three, hidden treasure, pearl of great price, and dragnet, let his disciples know he would do everything God intended. Matthew 13, verses 44 to 50. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells everything that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, 
and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold everything that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they pulled it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and remove the wicked from among the righteous, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The treasure explains God's actions towards his people. The pearl of great price depicts what God is doing with the church. The parable of the dragnet depicts God's efforts to reach out to Gentiles and bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. Number 18. Jesus spoke to Moses and Elijah in the New Testament. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the top of a mountain, above the snow line, where he changes right before their eyes. Peter says that Jesus' clothes became brighter than any bleaching agent on earth could make them. He uses the word detergent or fuller, which was the equivalent in those days. The light was shining through Jesus' clothes from the inside, and they could see his glory. As Luke records, he met with Moses and Elijah to discuss his exodus, which would result in the release of his people. The main point of the gospel is that Jesus' followers realize that he is the Christ, the Messiah. This is also something that the readers would come to understand. Number 19. He gets it all in the end. God has made Jesus the heir of all things, so the Son will one day have it all. Psalm 2.8 speaks of the nations being his inheritance. Psalm 2.8. Ask of it me, and I will certainly give the nations as your inheritance, and the ends of the earth as your possession. So the one whose own clothes were gambled for at the end of his first visit will return and reign over all kingdoms and peoples. Number 20. He made it all in the beginning. This son started it all. He was not just a humble carpenter, but was there at the beginning as the creator, initiating and deciding upon creation. John 1 verse 1 In the beginning was the Word, 